Hey everybody, it's Brian, and as we continue our study of the U.S. South region today, I'd like to begin with a question. Now think hard and see if you can answer this one. Of the eight U.S. presidents elected from 1976 through 2020, how many were from the South? Give up? The answer, almost unbelievably, is five. Five of the eight U.S. presidents elected during that 44-year span were from the South. What, you don't believe me? First, we have Joe Biden, elected in 2020 from Delaware, a southern state. Before that, you have George W. Bush of Texas, elected in 2000. Then, Bill Clinton of Arkansas, elected in 1992. George H.W. Bush, also from Texas, in 1988. And Georgia's Jimmy Carter, the 1976 presidential election winner. So, why begin today's lesson with that tidbit about presidential elections? Well, it reminds us of the power the South has in modern politics. What's even more interesting is that those five presidents have come from both parties. Biden, Clinton, and Carter from the Democrats, and both Bushes from the Republican Party. A fact that exemplifies the division found often in the South. Now, don't go away. Things are about to get heated up as we dive into the cultural conversions past present, and future of the South. Following the U.S. Civil War and Reconstruction, the Democratic Party dominated politics in the South for decades. In fact, from 1880 until 1960, the South voted predominantly Democratic in every presidential election. That began to change with the 1964 election won by Lyndon Baines Johnson, another Southerner, by the way, who won the national election easily but failed to carry five Southern states. The trend of the South to lean toward the Republican Party continued to grow over the next several decades. Now, keep in mind that today, the Republican Party generally supports lower taxes, free market economic principles, fewer federal government programs, and a conservative approach to social issues. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, usually supports expansion of government programs, a mixed economy approach, social equality, and a more liberal view on social issues. Nowhere in the U.S. is that divergence in opinion more on display than in the South. For example, when Jimmy Carter won the presidency in 1976, he won both Florida and Texas. As of 2021, that is the last time that both states have voted for the Democratic Party in the same election. The South has voted overwhelmingly Republican every year since. But in politics, things never really stay the same. For example, in the 2020 presidential election, Joe Biden defeated the incumbent Donald Trump. Biden did so by winning southern states such as Georgia, Virginia, Maryland, and his home state of Delaware, the four of which combined for 42 electoral college votes, crucial to the victory. It was the fourth consecutive presidential election that Virginia voted for the Democratic candidate, but Georgia, it was only the second time since 1980 that Georgia had voted blue. In January 2021, Control of the U.S. Senate hung in the balance as two seats were up for grabs in a special runoff election. The Republican Party already held 50 U.S. Senate seats, so a victory in even one of the elections guaranteed a GOP majority for the next two years. As fate would have it, both seats were to be decided by Georgia voters. And like the presidential election just weeks before, Georgia voters favored the Democratic candidates, denying Republicans the Senate majority. Those election results, of course, had consequences, and more on that later. You remember at the start of the lesson when you were asked the question about presidents? Five of the eight U.S. presidents elected from 1976 through 2020 were from the South, right? Those elections are reflected somewhat by the shift in population. The South, as of 2020, has about 37% of the nation's population, more than any other region. It also grew about 10% from 2010 through 2020, more than any other region again, continuing a trend from the previous 60 years. In fact, other than California, which grew from 32 electoral votes in 1960 to 55 in 2020, 
the biggest increases during that time have been in the South, specifically in Texas, which increased from 24 electoral votes to 38, and Florida, which grew from 10 to 29. Included in that group would also be Georgia, which saw its representation increase from 12 to 16, reflective of growth in many other southern states. So what happened to give the South such political power? Well, the Electoral College, or the final way in which the U.S. president is chosen, is based on representation in Congress, and the House of Representatives is based on population. So, if the South's population grows, yep, that's right, they will continue to receive larger shares of representation. During the time period from 1960 to 2020, several states saw a decline in population and thus a decrease in political power. These states include New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. All states in the Northeast and Midwest regions, and as you might have guessed, many of the people that moved from those states relocated to the South. With them, they brought their own cultural characteristics, values, and opinions. Waiting for the newcomers were millions of Southerners whose families have made the region its home for decades. One group in particular were brought to America and the South under less than favorable circumstances and for generations have resided in the region, often under less than ideal conditions. As of 2020, almost 48 million black people lived in the United States, and of that number, more than half lived in the South region. In fact, based on percentage of black population to the total state population, the nine states in the U.S. with the largest percentage of black residents are located in the South, led by Mississippi, with almost 39% of its residents identifying themselves as such. The fact that so many black people do live in the South is startling to many given the history of the region, specifically regarding the issue of slavery. The earliest slave markets in the American colonies popped up in cities such as New Orleans, Charleston, and Baltimore, and slavery of black people spread throughout the young nation following the American Revolution. Many northern states quickly banned that practice, but not so in the South. Many Southerners at the time felt slavery was so essential to their political survival that talk of seceding from the U.S. actually started in 1832, as South Carolina threatened to leave the Union over federal tariffs and what it saw as a hostile central government willing to infringe upon what the state considered to be its own business and within its rights. In fact, South Carolina was the first state to secede in 1860 after the election of Abraham Lincoln, a Kentuckian by birth who opposed slavery. By February 1861, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas had joined South Carolina. The first shots of the Civil War were fired at Fort Sumter shortly thereafter, and by June 8th, Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Tennessee had joined the Confederacy as well. Of course, we all know that the South lost the Civil War. The Confederacy ended in 1865, and Southern states were welcomed back, reluctantly by many, to the U.S. Slavery was ended later that year by the ratification of the 13th Amendment. Section 1 reads, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. However, even with that, the struggle for freedom and equality for black people was just getting started. Most black people freed by the 13th Amendment had nowhere else to go and stayed on their previous owner's land, working as laborers and sharecroppers under conditions not much better than bondage. The late 1800s and early 1900s saw Jim Crow laws passed by state and local governments in the South to maintain segregation and force second-class citizenship on black people. The U.S. Supreme Court actually upheld such treatment in an 1896 ruling, Plessy v. Ferguson, upholding the theory of separate but equal, and such practices were maintained for decades. Then, in the mid-20th century, things began to change. In 1947, Jackie Robinson, born in Georgia, became the first black man to play in a major professional sports league by suiting up for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The color barrier in sports had been broken. 
Just a few years later in 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, a protest moment which served to help light the spark of civil rights in the United States. In 1957, Little Rock High School in Arkansas became the first integrated public school that had previously only been open to white students. Sit-ins and peaceful protests at various restaurants and businesses began occurring in 1960. And in 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech during the March on Washington. Two years later, Dr. King led his march protesting for civil rights for minorities from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Civil rights legislation was passed incrementally beginning in 1957 and throughout the 1960s. While progress is undeniable across America, controversy regarding race is still ongoing, especially in the South. For example, a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee in Chancellorsville, Virginia, was taken down in July 2021 after protests and calls for its removal. While many other such monuments exist, predominantly in the South, the fact that the monument was taken down in Lee's home state of Virginia was a major victory for those fighting for it and considered an unnecessary erasure of the historical record for others. Another such place that has drawn similar criticism is Stone Mountain, Georgia. Located just east of Atlanta, Stone Mountain is a state-owned park based around a quartz modenock, or isolated hill of rock. Controversy comes from the north side of its edifice, as etchings in the rock pay homage to three Confederate Civil War heroes. Despite past mistreatment and present-day controversy, many black families have for generations stayed in the South. While many gravitated north to cities such as Chicago, Detroit, and Cleveland in search of jobs and a better future, many more stayed. So, today the South has a large black population, and they're joined by millions of residents who have moved from the North and Midwest. A third group has also grown in recent years, as more and more immigrants come from the South of the international border. Many of those people emigrating from Latin America came to work agricultural jobs, and most were meant to be temporary, but many have stayed. In particular, states such as Texas have boomed from a huge increase in the Hispanic Latino population from Mexico and Latin America. Texas, which was once part of Mexico and was briefly its own nation, as of 2020 is the second largest state with a population of some 29 million, with about 40% of that number claiming Hispanic and Latino status. The vast majority of that almost 12 million have Mexican roots, coming from south of the border or being a descendant of a Mexican immigrant. Like Texas, Florida's population continues to grow steadily as well, as newcomers from Mexico and other Hispanic nations have relocated to the Sunshine State. But no cultural diffusion there has been stronger than the Cuban influence. The third most populated state behind only California and Texas, according to the 2020 census, Florida has about 22 million residents, of which about 1.5 million are of Cuban descent. Many of those Cuban Americans live in the Miami metropolitan area, with many others in the Tampa area. Their influence continues to grow, culturally and economically. Of course, immigrants from elsewhere have always been a part of the South's history. For example, New Orleans and much of Louisiana is populated with descendants from France. But most of the South is made up of folks whose heritage comes from the British Isles, specifically England, Scotland, and Ireland. Keep in mind, though, that most of that immigration occurred decades, or more likely, centuries ago, and the South is now home to millions of Anglo descent. And a majority of those people are Christian of various Protestant religions, whose beliefs are sometimes more conservative than the rest of the nation. For example, those beliefs manifest around several moral debates, such as those regarding alcoholic beverages. Many cities and counties in the South have limitations on the sale of liquor, highlighted in red on this map, and many that do have laws limiting its purchase in various ways by city, county, and even state, which is highlighted in yellow. Other social issues are debated as well, including voting rights. Laws regarding voting rights are being considered all over the U.S. and in almost every state in 2021, but the region in which these actions are most prevalent is the South. In Texas alone, 49 bills regarding the issue were introduced in 2021. In Georgia, 24 such bills were introduced in 2021. Remember how earlier in the lesson we mentioned that Georgia was won by President Biden in the 2020 election and that in a runoff election in January 2021, not one but two U.S. Senate seats were won by Democrats as well. The result has kept Georgia in the crosshairs of political news. 
Just after the January 2021 Senate elections, the Georgia state legislature began plans for redistricting their legislative districts. The state governments also proposed legislation surrounding voter participation, including restrictions on in-mail ballots, drop boxes, and more stringent identification checks for voters. As mentioned, Georgia is just one of many states that at least proposed such legislation, but the long-term effects may not be known for decades. The South promises to remain at the forefront of political and economic developments. And with cultural convergence present in the South, it promises to be pretty interesting. Stay tuned and keep exploring. Hey!